Okay, so uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Luis Barbado, who joins us live from Vienna. Uh, very grateful to him for agreeing to give a colloquium like this over Zoom. Um, Luis did his PhD degree in theoretical physics in Spain at the Andalusian Institute for Astrophysics. Uh, since then, he's worked as a postdoc in Vienna, both at the University of Vienna and at the Institute for Quantum Optics and quantum information. He specializes in the field, uh, in the subject of quantum fields and curved space time. But today he'll be talking to us on a more conceptual issue in the foundations of quantum theory, namely on his recent work on the interpretation of quantum theory. So thank you very much, Luis, and um, please take it away. Okay, well, uh, thank you, uh, Philip. It's my my pleasure, and I thank uh, uh, first uh, Philip for for the invitation to give this uh, this talk, and also for for all of you who are who are who are attending it. Uh, yeah, as Philip uh, mentioned, I'm going to be talking about a recent uh, work, and uh, we are about to to uh, to upload in the archive. It should be ready. Uh, basically by next week uh, with this very same title as the talk on playing God, this fallacy of uh, many walls interpretation. Um, basically, as the title suggests, it's an, an, uh, we present a methodological argument uh, on, uh, that aims to refute uh, the, the, the many walls interpretation as a tenable interpretation of, of quantum mechanics. So, uh, let me give the outline of the talk. I will very briefly go uh, through um, through the what is the interpretation itself and uh, um, uh, what is the account it gives of the very well known measurement measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Uh, and and already by introducing the the interpretation, I will be doing a quick sort of quick spoiler of, of what is the core of the argument and why we believe that this is not a valid interpretation of, of quantum mechanics. Uh, then I will uh, go uh, through um, uh, through what we call the holistic inference loop, uh, which is uh, a sort of, of it, it is uh, a kind of argumental fallacy, which it can be presented in a much more generic way, not just in the form it, it appears in the, in the many worlds uh, interpretation, right? And I'm going to introduce it in a, in a generic way, and I will try to go more into the details of, of what this fallacy means and, and why we believe it is incompatible with, about, with basic facts about how natural science uh, works. And uh, then once I do this, I will go back again to, to many worlds interpretation and see how this uh, fallacy more, more in detail, how it, uh, how it appears in the many worlds interpretation. And I will try to do it through examples uh, in, the, in the work, in the article that is going to be published or in the, in the um, preprint that we are going to load to the archive, you will find a more like say, organize step by step uh, the uh, argumentation here I will try to focus more and more on being more descriptive and using some examples and and try to 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 show you in more graphical terms uh, what 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 is the problem of many worlds interpretation about and then we uh, I will end with some discussion so um the introduction. Let's very briefly go through what is called the measurement problem. I mean, the measurement problem already. It, it, it it's one of like the, I would say the core problem that has been undergoing the interpretations of of quantum mechanics, uh, and the and the one that divides um, uh, the different interpretations more dramatically. I would say. And even the pose, how how one poses a problem is uh, is already a discussion within the the physics community. So I will go very briefly through uh, through the way I see it and in in a more schematic way of for what we need for the for this um, for what I'm going to talk later. So basically, in quantum mechanics, in the orthodox say Copenhagen interpretation of of the um, of the theory, you have two sorts of evolutions. One is the unitary evolution uh, given by a Schrodinger equation, 
which is deterministic given it provides given that you know the Hamiltonian that you know the dynamics of the system of your quantum system it predicts unambiguously what's going to be the the time evolution of this system and let me be give a simple example of what an unitary evolution would be for example this is a beam splitter and if you send a, a particle uh, right um, towards the beam splitter uh, so the particle is initially in the state of of following this trajectory in this direction uh, then the beam splitter acts unitarily on the on the um, uh, on the state of the particle and it puts it in a new state which is a quantum superposition of keeping following the same trajectory or getting deflected towards the other trajectory and this is a specific state and it's always the same it's it's an a, a completely predictable evolution and one can check that this has nothing to do with being sometimes up sometimes down because you can do interferometry with it and check that this is a very specific unique state and it's always the same right and on the other hand and like that there are many other unitary evolutions right um then you have another different kind of evolution which is the measurement and the collapse of the wave function which is that in some other situations typically when you try to measure the system the question is what is measurement but typically when you if you will leave aside the question for a moment when you try to measure the system it is this kind of evolution that occurs for example if we get this state that we had and we just project it on a, on a screen here we will find that 50 percent of the times we find that the particle went on the up direction and then its state collapses towards this state or 50 percent of times we will find that it goes bottom and we'll find this and we one cannot predict it's a completely different kind of evolution and one just can predict these probabilities this is the simplest case 50 50 there could be other probabilities according to the Born rule and so on and then the question is okay why is it that we have two evolutions and when should we apply what right why when should we apply why is it that a beam splitter does this unitary thing and does always the same thing and when we put a screen we get different uh we we get a unknown uh an unpredictable result uh, well, there are many different answers to this. Uh, some theories pretend that this is an objective thing. Some uh, the collapse really does happen. Some other theories, uh, some other interpretations pretend it doesn't, and so on and so forth. And I will go to directly. We don't have time to to go into the details of the different possibilities. I will go to what the many walls interpretation solution is. Many walls interpretation rejects that this is really a thing that is happening in nature, right? And takes only this kind of evolution. Only air, everything is just purely unitary evolution. And then you may say, well, and how does this interpretation give account of the fact that in the lab we do see a probabilistic uh, result? Well, it believes that this probability result is just a subjective experience of yours. And how it does it? Well, by noticing that we, the observers, are also quantum systems and will need to be included in the in the in the whole description. Right? So here is what the account for the for what it just happened here at the bottom. What would be the account of, of many worlds? Where you well, you start with your state of a quantum superposition of, of your particle traveling either up or down, your screen, which is has no has detected nothing so far, and you yourself, you are a quantum system and you have you haven't seen anything yet happening. Then the system evolves, evolves unitarily to a completely predictable state, which is this one, in which you find an entanglement this is a situation where you have entanglement between the particle having gone up between it's a tangent between the, the trajectory of the particle and the spot you you find in the screen and the two components of this entanglement is the part, the particle having gone up and the screen getting the spot on the top 
and the particle having on bottom and the screen getting a spot on the bottom. Since the screen is also a quantum system, because, and I haven't said it, quantum mechanics is universal, that's one of the statements of many worlds interpretation, everything can be descript, described by quantum mechanics, in particular the screen. So they evolve in this way. This is the dynamics and the dynamics gives this situation. So it's not that sometimes there is a spot up and sometimes there's a spot down. Both things somehow are happening and you just get entanglement. But finally, you yourself are a quantum system. You haven't yet in, at this moment detect, seen anything, maybe because you haven't watched the screen yet. But then at some point you look at the screen and then you get entangled with the screen and with the particle. And then this is the new state of the everything. Altogether, it's always the same state. There is nothing happening with probabilities. And you have two components, one in which you are in the spot is on the top and you are watching the spot being on the top and another component in which the spot is on the bottom and you are watching the spot being on the bottom. And both things are happening in, at the same time. That's why it is called many worlds. When these situations happen, what you have is that you have two parallel worlds in each of which you are, uh, you are perceiving something different. But all the time, every time you run the experiments, both things happen. And the kind of subjective experience that you get is that only one, only one of those happen. And then there is a construction done more specifically that we, I'm not gonna go into the details of, of of it because we don't have time and because it's not relevant for what I'm going to, for the argument I'm going to give, there are some uh, reasons by which uh, the proposers of many worlds say that really you get a subjective experience of having different probabilities of either this or that happening, while in reality it's everything happening at the same time. Okay, this uh, interpretation has been criticized. Uh, I haven't said, but you can interrupt me. I don't know if they can. People can use the chat. I would get uh, some uh, some advices, if, uh, some some signal, uh, Philip. Uh, right. Yes. I mean, people could ask you questions. We typically leave questions for the end. Oh, okay. Okay. What, yeah. what you prefer. Okay. I would be open, but if you prefer to leave it for the end. That's well, actually, okay. you know, occasionally people ask questions while it's happening. So, um, but they'll just then speak, I, I think, or raise their hand and then okay. speak. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. So, yeah. So, um, so yeah, this, uh, this interpretation has been criticized on several aspects like okay what when does this branching of universes happen does it happens here already or here or what what is the basis because you could you could uh, write down this state in a different basis why is uh, is some basis special so on and so forth and then the defenders of the interpretation then they find solutions for that and we are not entering this uh, these uh, arguments we are going to something different if you notice, you we needed to uh, in order to understand what is happening in this situation, we needed to make use of the fact that quantum mechanics is universal. The very interpretation makes an explicit use of this fact, and we claim. Let me say it very briefly at the beginning. We claim that this uh, assumption is illegitimate, and you may say, "Well, why is it that it's illegitimate?" We have made assumptions that of theories being universal or the theories of Newton universal law of gravitation. We believe that general relativity is, if we discard some point quantum gravity, but it may account uh, of, a, of an universal or at least on all, on all phenomena having to do with space time, whatever. So there are many other theories that claim for universality in their own sense, why it should be illegitimate to use it. Well, then let me rephrase it, the, the point. We are not saying that claiming that un, quantum mechanics is universal is legitimate. We claim that necessarily using the fact that quantum mechanics is universal in order to account for the, out, the, um, for the empirical evidence of each and every single experiment you do is problematic. And actually we claim it's illegitimate. 
If you think of it, what we were trying to reproduce is just these simple probabilities here, 50-50. And this happens all the time, anytime we run this experiment, whether it is a dog, a cat, a monkey, ourselves, anything that is perceiving this, it doesn't matter. It always happens like that, 50-50, right? Once you put the screen. So, but on the other hand, for keeping the consistency, assuming that the rest of the elements of the interpretation work, for keeping the consistency of this interpretation, you really need, because it's a part of, explicit part of the interpretation, that whatever becomes affected by the concrete result that has appeared in each of the branches, because in many Wells interpretation, none of the re un results appears unically, uh, you really need that the screen and the observer, and if I talk to a friend and I say, hey, I saw the spot wherever I saw it in each of the branches, then in order to keep consistently, I did that my friend is also quantum, and if I put a robot, the robot should be also quantum, and so on and so forth. And this, it's necessary to explain what is happening with a particle on the screen. It's not that you claim it as a, a supposition of universality, it's that you really need it. So if at some point we find that quantum mechanics happens not to account for certain aspects, we will be in trouble. But because it's not that quantum mechanics will, be, will start to fail for this new thing we have found that doesn't work according to quantum mechanics. It would be that if we buy many world's interpretations, suddenly we have problems in understanding the quantum systems themselves, because the experimental evidence we have about them, we have made it dependent on quantum mechanics being strictly universal. Okay, this is the spoiler I will do, I, I, I promise I would do, and then let me put it in a little more, uh, to go a little bit more uh, step by step through through it. So this, uh, this uh, use of, of the universality of a theory as, a, as an argument that you invoke in each and every, uh, in each and every time you use a theory for explaining concrete phenomena is with what we call the holistic inference loop, right? And I will go through it, but um, we, uh, when in, in the article, and I won't go into much detail into that again because in, in to that here because we don't have much time. We try to justify why the this uh, holistic inference loop really uh, is incompatible with how natural science is, is is constructed, and we use really three very simple facts about how natural science works as a human activity, which are these. Three, we call them facts about natural science, and these are the three that I mentioned here. First, you need to think that uh, the empirical evidence we have about nature is always limited by the range of observations we have done at a certain stage of, of, of the development of science, right? We have, there's no way we can say we have explored all possible um, phenomena that we will ever we will ever be capable of exploring. There's always a chance that tomorrow we find new regimes, new situations, new uh, systems, new uh, uh, range of applicability, whatever, where we find new phenomena that we hadn't accessed yet, and then we need uh, it's completely new and may require new theories. This is one element that I think we should all agree about. Second, uh, scientific theories are just human creations. Again, it's it's a fact. We don't find theories out there written in tablets of stone. We, we, we build them up. Different scientists have been building up different theories. We may contrast them with, with empirical evidence and check whether they reproduce it or not. But it is not that we find them out there. They are human creations. So, so there is no other source for 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 theories, but to be built by by humans, uh, uh, by human scientific activity, and finally, just a desideratum by definition of what natural science is about, 
what we call a valid scientific theory should be, well, first self-consistency, but very importantly, empirically adequate, main, meaning it should, whatever theory you build, should be capable of accounting for empirical evidence, right? And we say that if at some point the way you try to build up a theory, which is what we believe it happens with theory centered the holistic inference loop, and in particular many worlds interpretation, if you happen to try to build such a theory, which by its very construction, it's incompatible with these simple facts, then you have a problem because you are pretending to do something you are truly not doing, right? For example, you are pretending that you have explored already all range of phenomena ever accessible, or you are pretending that there is some other reason that a theory should be correct beyond it being capable of explaining empirical evidence, so on and so forth. Um, so this is like the, the ground where we start with and the only we believe the only ingredients we need to, to justify why within the holistic inference loop, theory centered the holistic inference loop uh, are problematic. So let me uh, show here a simple um, scheme for how one could uh, validate a theory, right? So we have here setting phenomena we would like to Explain with a theory, natural phenomena, migration of birds, uh, some chemical reaction, some gravitational phenomena, collision of what of galaxies, anything. And we collect some by observation, we collect some experimental evidence for it, right? We collect a certain amount of data about it. Well, if the theory, then we may propose a theory, and if the theory happens to correctly reproduce and predict the empirical evidence we collect about this phenomena, well, this implies we can say that these theories applying to this phenomena or it explains this phenomena, um, and that's it. I mean, it's a very simple, uh, stupid, if you wish, scheme, but uh, what interests me is the use I'm going to do it when explaining the holistic inference loop. So. Um, this would be a correct validation, right, of a theory. You manage to explain the empirical evidence you have about a phenomena. Well, you say that this theory applies to that phenomenon. Now, what happens if you have the holistic inference loop? Um, well, you have a main problem here. When you say that your theory, imagine that when you are trying to justify that your theory reproduces the empirical evidence you have about your phenomena, right? Like, so this capacity of reproducing the empirical evidence and predicting empirical evidence just does not flow along. It depends on something. And I hope here you're already recalling what I said about many walls interpretation. It is explicitly depending on something. It's depending on some hypothesis you did that the theory is also applying to some other arbitrary phenomena, like in the many walls interpretation, in order to account for why I said that we find 50-50 probabilities, we were assuming and we were introducing as an ingredient in, in our explanation that the screen was quantum, that I was quantum, that any other observer you could put there to see the problem, uh, to see the experiment and become affected by the experiment is also quantum. So definitely you're assuming that your theory, namely quantum mechanics, the many worlds interpretation of it, is applying to some arbitrary phenomena, which is basically whatever may become affected by the experiment. Okay. So your theory, the explanation, the reproduction of the empirical evidence is not direct. It's depending on this hypothesis and on this hypothesis strictly holding in all this extent. Only if you assume the hypothesis, then you may say, ah, oh, okay, uh, the theory reproduces empirical evidence, then the theory is applicable to my phenomena, in this case, the quantum phenomena. The problem you have is that this theory cannot be ever validated because you are pretending that your theory is applying to just some arbitrary phenomena. In the case of many worlds interpretation, you are pretending that it universally applies. And this is something you can never validate. 
this is is it's not possible to validate such thing. But if you don't think about it, and you just assume that a hypothesis may be okay, let's just forget about this for a second, then you may say, oh, my theory is truly describing the correctly describing some phenomena, like say, for example, the experiment we did with a screen or some other, whatever other quantum experiment we may do with Stein Gerlach, as we will see later, or something else. So yeah, true, my theory is, is, is describing everything correctly. And then you see that your theory apparently describes everything correctly, so on. And at some point you see that it describes so many phenomena that you may say, well, let's make the hypothesis that this theory is universal, that it applies to just arbitrary anything. But this is a loop argument, it's a circular argument. And this is what we call the holistic inference loop, right? And let me, again, uh, um, say, emphasize two elements that I wrote here in, in red that are critical for, for, for this argument we are doing to apply. First, this is what we call the holistic hypothesis that you're using. It requires that in this hypothesis, the phenomena you pretend the theory applies to has to be some arbitrary range, like for example, applying universally. You're applying to some to some range of phenomena you are you will never be able to embrace. Because it could be the case that you can do a hypothesis, a say holistic hypothesis, but it's for a limited range of phenomena, then in principle would be no problem because at some point this you you could possibly exhaust that range of phenomena empirically and then your hypothesis is validated. And then everything is validated. That's fine. So this is very important, right? It's not that all holistic uh, arguments are wrong. No, some holistic arguments, like typically in, in ecology, where everything is interconnected with everything and you have to, to, to treat all together, could be valid. But not these sort of arguments. And the second and most important, I would say, um, a part of, of, of what we call the holistic inference loop is that this hypothesis needs to be uh, a, a critical element, a, a necessary ingredient in relating the theory with experimental evidence of any phenomena whatsoever, as we saw in many walls interpretation, right? Otherwise, I mean, just doing the holistic hypothesis, even for arbitrary phenomena itself, is not a problem. That's what we do when we said when we said that's what we did when we said that uh, Newton's theory applies universally. Well, we just said it, but we didn't need that it applied universally when we are applying it to the planets, where we were applying it to an apple falling on Earth. We didn't need to. We just made the hypothesis, and at some point, the hypothesis proved actually wrong because we know that Newtonian theory of gravity is, does not hold universally in its original form. But that's itself not a problem. You can formulate a hypothesis, a hypothesis. The problem is when you require it in each and every application of your theory. Okay. Uh, well, I already presented the uh, many walls interpretation and uh, the holistic inference loop. Uh, so let me now go uh, very graphically uh, through um, through a couple of examples uh, where I hope I will uh, be able to uh, to transmit you more uh, more clearly the problems to which this leads. So the first one situation is I'm going to tell a story. I called it the many world the castaway. So. This is Bob. He's um, he's a uh, many walls defender. He's a theoretical physicist who really trusts that many walls is the correct interpretation of of quantum mechanics, right? And uh, he was flying through the Pacific Ocean, say, and at some point he got an accident, like Tom Hanks in the in the movie, and and he just happened to 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 be left in in an island, right? Uh, but fortunately for him, like Tom Hanks, the highland was not inhabited. It was inhabited by people who had been kept away from civilization 
since the 19th century. So I called it the classic alignment. And in particular, the physics, the physics they use, which they have a physicist here, with, who is Alice. Alice is the physicist of the classical island. The physics they use is still the classical one. They have never heard, and the classical in the sense of 19th century, so they have never heard about relativity, general relativity, or quantum mechanics. They, have, they know nothing about it. So when Bob arrives, they, he's taken by the people of the island, they help him, they help him to recover from the accident and so on, and then they start talking physics, no? He asks, okay, what's the physics that you do here? Alice says, well, we do, you know, classical physics. Well, she doesn't call it classical, of course, but we do physics, uh, Newton, Newton's, uh, Newton's laws, Newton's theory of gravitation, Maxwell equations, thermodynamics, all these things. Um, so far, we have some conceptual problems, where, but we didn't find anything better. And then Bob says, well, you're missing a lot. There's a, there's a lot that has happened out there since, since, uh, since, since then, since 19th century. And we have two very big and very beautiful and mind-blowing theories that really supersede um, this, uh, what we have called now classical mechanics that you're using. They are general relativity and they are uh, quantum mechanics. Alice is impressed and says, okay, please tell me about these, these theories. And, and he goes first with general relativity. And he explains uh, general relativity to Alice. Well, space and time are not anymore space and time. There is space time, which is a manifold and, and it's curved by what you call gravity, by the presence of mass, so on and so forth. Well, he goes through, through the explanation of the theory Alice is impressed and she says, okay, Bob, please show me that this theory is correct and show me some, some experiments I could check. And then they go through different experiments. They, assuming that they were capable of, of measuring things accurately enough, which of course is, <laughs> is to be doubted, but let's forget that for a second. They go and they measure, for example, the gravitational blue shift in a tower uh, or they wait for an eclipse and they see how the light coming from star bends because of the gravitation of the sun. Uh, they may uh, figure out, they may be capable of measuring the, measuring the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. All these things are not accounted for by, by Newton's theory of gravity and, uh, and by uh, Euclidean conception of space and an absolute time. So Alice is astonished. She said, oh, wow, well, this really works, right? You have given me the theory. You have said that it applies to this and this and that. I went to the experiments. The, the experiments are reproduced. Fair enough. I buy the theory completely. Tell me about the other theory. Tell me about quantum mechanics. I want to hear about it. And then Bob thinks something, okay. These people, in particular Alice, have never heard about quantum mechanics. And in particular, she has never heard about this collapse of the wave function, measuring probabilities, um, all, all this confusion that has the people believed at some point that these things do occur, you know, that collapse really happens or that you can uh, implement it. Well, all the other interpretations you have, she has never heard about that. So why shouldn't I do something? Let me just tell Alice the correct thing. Let me tell Alice just purely unitary evolution. I'm not gonna tell Alice anything about probabilities. I'm not gonna say that the, the, the system collapses, nothing like that. I will just tell her unitary evolution. Quantum mechanics, yes, with unitary evolution. And then when we go to the experiments, I will explain her what's going on. So that's what he does. He explains uh, Alice quantum mechanics. He well, um, quantum systems are described by a state vector in a Hilbert space that evolves according to an unitary evolution given by a Schrodinger equation. You have tensor product of Hilbert spaces for different systems, so on and so forth. He goes in explanation of the formalism of the theory. Alice is surprised. It's a very abstract, mathematically beautiful theory. And she says, okay, 
fine, you explain me the theory, show me, show it to me in action. Show, show me an experiment where I can see that this theory works. And they go, for example, to the Stengel experiment. This is a Stengel experiment, typical quantum experiment, where you uh, send a, a beam of, of particles uh, with uh, some spin that implies some magnetic dipole, right? In particular, we prepare it in a quantum superposition of the spin being up and the spin being down in this way. And then you let them pass through a magnetic field. And because of the interaction with the magnetic field, the particles get deflected. And of course, what you see in the, um, in the lab is that for this particular preparation, half of the times the particle gets deflected up and half of the time it gets deflected down. That's, that's what you find experimentally. That's, that's what Alice will see. Even though the preparation is always the same, it's this state. So Alice is confused. Alice say, okay, Bob, I have a problem here. You told me uh, um, a theory with an unitary evolution. In particular, let's assume that uh, they have described on a first stage quantum mechanically just uh, the spin of the particle and the trajectory of the particle, just that, right, so far. So what Alice would compute is this state, just taking away by now this part, right? You take away these parts. So Alice has computed this state. This is what the theory gives her. The theory that Bob gives to her, gives her this state. And she says, this is not what I get in the experiment because this is always the same state. And I get different things at a time. I Sometimes I get, the particle going up, sometimes they get going down. So I don't, I actually wouldn't know what to expect with this state because I, this entanglement, I don't know what, what should I perceive out there, but definitely this is not what I see because this is always the same thing and I get different things. And then Bob says, well, Alice, you, know, you have to take into account one thing, the screen is also quantum. Yeah, it can be described by quantum mechanics also. Trust me, I tell you. Alice says, okay, fair enough, then I buy. And then Alice computes this other state, yet not with her introduced yet. This other state, if you cut from here, a quantum superposition between this and that. And she says, okay, I have introduced quantum mechanically the screen. You told me it's describable, but, but I, this is still not what I see. <laughs> and actually, Bob, I'm confused because the equations you gave me it's deterministic, so it doesn't matter what I do, I will always get the same result and I don't see always the same result, what's going on? I'm confused. And then Bob tells her the last truth. It's like, wait, Alice, you forgot. You are also a quantum system. You are also a quantum system, so you have to get yourself into the problem. And you have to consider that you are going to get also entangled with the system, you know, the many worlds interpretation tell I told at the beginning, and then he starts to speak about these parallel worlds where you um, subjectively perceive that you saw the particle up or you saw the particle down while all everything is going on at the same time and so on and so forth. Then she, he reveals the truth to Alice in hope that Alice will just completely just surrender to the truth. But Alice doesn't. Alice is puzzled. And Alice says, I'm sorry, Bob, but I'm confused. And not because of these parallel worlds. This, okay, it's strange, but I could buy. I'm confused because of something else. You've presented here to me a theory, and you haven't given me a single empirical evidence yet so far. I haven't seen the theory in action yet. I haven't seen that the theory is predicting something that I could test in the lab. I, I didn't. And you're pretending that without any single empirical evidence, you tell me that this theory is capable of explaining all the mechanisms in my brain that leads to me becoming conscious of that spot that I see in the screen. I'm sorry, but I don't buy. <laughs> I don't buy. I, I don't have any reasons to buy this. Of course, Bob will say, well, but Alice really trust me, this theory is 
amazing. We have checked it in just basically everything, structure of matter, um, structure of the atoms and of and particle physics and nucleus decays and everything. We have checked it in many things. And Alice says, well, show me one, please. Show, show one to me. So show me something in which the theory works. You, you haven't showed to me anything yet so far. And it's true. Bob can't tell Alice anything and can't show any single empirical evidence on quantum mechanics. And if, if he really buys the many worlds interpretation and rejects stating anything about probabilities at a fundamental level or measurement at a fundamental level, he cannot give Alice any single empirical evidence of quantum mechanics that will convince Alice unless Alice buys a priori, a priori before the empirical evidence she needs to buy that this whole theory is describing her consciousness, whatever that means, by the way. So, well, this is a deployment in form of a story, which I hope it was graphical enough, but this is really what logically happens with the theory. You first have to buy that is universal, and in particular, I will go with this thing about universality now. In particular, you need to buy that it applies to your whole consciousness as a prerequisite to be able to say that the theory correctly explained the Stengel experiment. And this is problematic. Of course, and since I have time, I'm still, I'm in 40 minutes now, no? I should, I, I think I will have time to, to go through the last things, yeah. You may say, well, there's still a chance no, to, uh, to, to survive for, for the theory to survive cell consistently because, well, after all, it seems that for this particular experiment they are doing, it would be enough if really, truly our consciousness is describable with quantum mechanics, no? If it was, then that's fine. Already Alice sees half of the time up, surjectively sees half of the time up, half of the time down because of disentanglement, so on, so forth. Well, there are the other criticisms that are done to the interpretation, but we are not getting into those. At the criticism we would be doing seems that would be broken, no? Because if you happen to just uh, be able to prove that your consciousness can be accounted for with quantum mechanics, then the game is over. Well, we argued that not. First for me, and this is a personal view, that I could try to defend, but it's not part of this article. I find it already weird that we need to account for consciousness in order to account for a Stein Gerlach. But even if we could, still the game would not be over. Would you really need the theory to be universal, to be the last word, or otherwise it's not capable of explaining anything? Um, the reason is simple, is that I said it at the beginning, everything should possible become affected by the concrete result that you're going to perceive here. Anything, anything you put. And in particular, some post-quantum system we may find, if they happen to seek, should possibly become affected also. And this leads to a contradiction because you're assuming that the theory is universal. Let me go uh, into detail into, into this. And with this, I finished the, the talk apart from the last discussion. So uh, imagine that we do the experiment, a Stengel experiment, and by the end, depending on, on the trajectory that the particle follows, we just, the mechanism of, of our machine just raises a flag. It's sometimes a yellow flag. If, if the particle goes up, it's a yellow flag. If the particle goes down, it's a green flag. According to the usual interpretation uh, of quantum mechanics where you can say that you really do measurements and, and you get uh, and you get concrete results. Uh, okay, that's the experiment we do. My question, can we use the color of the flag as an, as an empirical evidence, just as simple as empirical evidence for some other experiment we are going to do later? For example, Imagine that we are 
trying to test how flies perceive different colors. And we are going to use a fly. Can we use, just forget about the fact that this flag comes from, from a quantum experiment and so on, and just use the color of the flag as saying, okay, I'm putting a yellow flag or a green flag in here. Well, many worlds interpretation will tell you yes. And you may ask why, because the, in the many worlds interpretation, the flag is not yellow or green. It's all the time both of them appearing. It's all the time all, both of them appearing. How is it that I can still use the color of flag? Well, the many worlds interpretation will tell you because the flies are quantum. The flies are quantum, so the fly will become entangled with the concrete color of the flag. And the two states of the color of the flag are very distinguishable and interference with them is just completely negligible. So in each of the branches of the universe, you will act as if the color was that, the one that you are perceiving. You could be also here together with a fly entangled and seeing also the yellow flag or the green flag, depending on the branch, right? So there's no problem. Even though everything is happening at the same time and you just get a huge wave function with, with a, two different possibilities occurring at the same time, your subjective experience will be that of a fly, a fly seeing a yellow flag, a fly seeing a green flag. So you can use the flag, no problem. But because a fly is quantum. What if we were to use some system that we don't know, we're not sure if it's quantum or not. We are trying to check. Quantum mechanics is, is, about, um, is about empirical evidence, empirical theory. It, we should be able, to, we should possibly test it empirically. So imagine that we don't put a fly, we put a blue unicorn. We don't know if blue unicorns are quantum. We are not sure yet. We, we want to test them. Well, can we use the color of the flag? Now it's problematic because I would doubt, according to many worlds, even if I see the flag as yellow, the flag is not yellow. The flag is always in a superposition, entangled superposition of, 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 of both. And the only reason why the fly reacts as if it was yellow is because the fly is quantum and it becomes entangled and so on and so forth. But I cannot say the same thing for the, for the unicorn because I don't know. So what should I do? Maybe I can't use the color of the flag. Shall I use the complete wave function? Maybe I could use the complete wave function. The, the, the many walls interpretation is telling you that the ultimate reality is about the wave function, that the rest of it is just empirical, it's just subjective experience. So maybe I should use just the wave function as the empirical, correct empirical evidence to use with something that I don't know if it's gonna become entangled or not because I, I just don't know how it works. But still you have a problem because which wave function? Anything we see around us whatsoever, anything, the fact that we run the spring, the, the fact that we have a flag, all these, if you trace it back, are, res are consequences of former results of quantum measurements. So what wave function should I use? If I use this one, I admit that I have done the experiment. But probably if I go back, I will realize that the fact that I did the experiment or not, I could trace it back to some results of quantum measurements, not because you did it as measurements in the lab, but simply quantum mechanisms that occurred in the past and that yielded me, I mean, that yielded me in this particular branch doing the experiment and getting a flag, but in other branches, I'm doing something different. So if I use this concrete wave function, I admitted that I ran the experiment and then I have problems with many worlds description of other quantum behaviors that happened in the past. I can't use any wave function. I don't know what wave function to use. If you talk to many world people, they will say that there are other parallel universes where we are not where we are, where the buildings around us are not what, what, uh, 
where where we see them, where even the planets and the galaxies are not those that we see. And the only reason we do see all these things is because we get entangled consistently with them. So we act as if this concrete subjective experience that we see was real, although it's not. And this is something that many defenders of many worlds do believe. So if I'm if the blue un unicorn is not quantum, or we don't know if it's quantum, what empirical evidence around us should we use? We can't use anything. Or maybe at some point we say, okay, let's assume we can. Let's assume we can use some empirical evidence around us to uh, to test to just test how the blue unicorns behave, how how they perceive colors. For example, let's take the color of the flag as as just an, a, a, a graphical example of an empirical evidence. I could use any other thing. Just let's take the color for simplicity. Well, I will be testing the blue unicorn against the color of the flag. And sometimes I put a yellow flag and the unicorn will do something. And sometimes put a green flag and it will find the unicorn doing something different. And imagine I get a post-quantum behavior. I say, OK. I can't describe the unicorn with quantum mechanics. I found something beyond quantum mechanics. I can't anymore. Then how is it that when I put a yellow flag, it reacts as with a yellow flag, and when I put a green flag, it reacts as a green flag? I cannot tell the story anymore of many worlds. I can't because. I cannot write a cat for the blue unicorn. I can't, it, it's described differently. So I don't know. Suddenly all this description becomes uh, compromised. Why? Because what I said at the beginning, the consistency of this description depends on anything becoming accessible to that description being quantum mechanical. As soon as you try to make this to interact with something which you don't know if it's quantum mechanical, the whole quantum mechanical description of this, including the spin particle, including the particle trajectory, which we thought were so quantum mechanical, becomes compromised. OK, this is the argument. Let me summarize. And uh, with this, I, I'm open for questions. The summary is the following. Many worlds interpretation does not account for empirical evidence of measurement outcomes of quantum experiments. It does not, unless you formulate first the holistic hypothesis and buy it in all its extent and say that it is true in all its extent. Otherwise, you, don't, you are not reproducing empirical evidence. Okay. The problem is that holistic hypothesis cannot be verified because it's stating that quantum mechanics is universal and this you will never have enough because of these limitations of, of natural science that we I mentioned. You can never be sure about that completely. The only thing that can happen to that hypothesis is that it becomes refuted because we find something beyond quantum mechanics. And then since every single explanation of every empirical evidence whatsoever was dependent on that hypothesis, as soon as it is refuted, whole many worlds interpretation also of quantum systems becomes refuted. This is the summary of, of it. And this is why we believe that many worlds interpretations and untenable interpretations of quantum mechanics it's not the only one. There are other interpretations. I haven't mentioned it here in the discussion. Maybe I should, like, for example, superdeterminism or some Lagrangianism views of quantum mechanics that we will try to address in future works that basically fall in the same uh, fallacy for different reasons. Uh, but in particular, many worlds interpretation does fall into this fallacy in the holistic inference loop and therefore we believe it's untenable as an interpretation of quantum mechanics. Uh, we believe also, let me check. Okay, I, I just finished with that, that 
these theories that fall into a holistic inference loop may be also problematic because since you are relying on, on this universality to try to explain anything whatsoever, it's much, much harder that you are open to, uh, and this is, uh, we are, we are uh, I'm talking now about a sort of sociological aspect, if you wish, of, 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 um, of this. It's much harder if you have relied on universality to explain anything that you are willing to give up your theory for something different, because you have to give it completely, to give it up completely for something new. We believe that quantum mechanics is very successful, as we know it for empirical evidence. So we should be looking for an interpretation that survives, that anytime we find something new, it's not problematic because just as classical mechanics, as Newtonian mechanics is kept as a correct limit of quantum mechanics and of general relativity, quantum mechanics rather for falling apart as many worlds interpretation we believe will do anytime we find something new, we believe that we should be looking for, a, for an interpretation that survives because quantum mechanics is really successful. But many worlds interpretation won't be this, inter won't be this one. And with this, I'm finished. Thanks for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Luis. So I had a question. <clears throat> So, am I audible? Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, that was a nice talk. Uh, so, in the illustration, uh, graphic illustration of the uh, castaway uh, Bob meeting Alice from the uh, classical island, uh, it seems that that illustration points to a dichotomy. Uh, on the one hand, that we have uh, the fact that there is no known violation for quantum mechanics. And on the other hand, we have the observation that it's meaningless to apply quantum mechanics to uh, systems like a cat or a tree or a table. Uh, and this also seems to rhyme with uh, one of Asher Perez's statement that quantum mechanics can be applied to anything, but not everything. Uh, and this is often seen as a problem. I'm wondering if you think this could be seen as a feature that awaits to be recognized as a feature rather than being seen as a problem? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what is the content of uh, of of this statement by by Perez uh, that can be applied to anything but not to everything. Uh, um, I believe, uh, yeah, this from Cubism. Uh, it's uh, this. It sounds very much in the line of Cubism. Um, I, I, I honestly, I wouldn't be sure about here. I would say, uh, but this is a very first uh, improvised uh, answer that for us, it's basically equally problematic because we, the problem is not whether uh, you be, you believe and, and you make the statement just for the sake of to our knowledge today, we can apply quantum mechanics to anything or to everything. Uh, the problem is not the statement per se. The problem is the use you make of this statement. And for us, the problematic is when you take, you really need to take this this statement too seriously anytime you apply the the theory. And I wouldn't know if the if Perez formulation would have this problem or 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 not. I, I'm I'm not I'm not sure. I, I would need to to think about it. But in principle, I mean, the fact that you change everything for anything, actually we, in the formulation of the holistic inference loop, we don't talk about in the holistic hypothesis, not about universal phenomena, but rather arbitrary. For us, it's just important that you cannot, you cannot embrace it altogether, that you are not capable of saying, okay, fine, I, I'm, I'm, I'm done with it. I just, I just, uh, uh, I just uh, exhausted the phenomena I needed to confirm my hypothesis. This is for us. So on a first stage, I would say that formulation with anything would be equally problematic, but it's just an improvised answer. 
Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I had another question. Uh, so how does this relate to uh, Bohr's emphasis uh, on his concept of classical concepts? He didn't really define that very clearly, but, uh, uh, and he repeatedly emphasized that however advanced our theories might get certain aspects uh, of physics, namely that whatever experiment we do, they need to be described in classical language they are going to stay. And that seems to be also illustrated in the uh, graphic illustration. Um, okay. Uh, so you're meaning, uh, I there was some, uh, I don't hear you like 100% curly, but I think I, I got uh, the point. So you're saying that uh, that in the end, doesn't matter what, uh, what ontological, sorry, um, uh, constructions we do for quantum mechanics, whatever, in the end, experiments uh, and the description of the outcome of experiments shall, shall be done in classical terms. This is what you are meaning? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, I, I mean, uh, I mean, I would say that uh, uh, I'm not sure what relation would it, would it have um, uh, because uh, I would say that not only that um, that we have to do it them in classical terms. I would say that in the end, the experiments when the the statement of outcomes of experiments, I'm improvising. Maybe this is we need to do them even in in non-relativistic terms. Meaning what? And and let me even though we. We uh, we describe motion of planets and so on in, in in a manifold, and we understand or we believe we understand quite nicely the precession of the perihelion of Mercury and so on. In the end, what you registered with a uh, um, with a telescope and so on is not really the position of or the curvature of you register images that in the end you will put on a on, on a mirror in the. So in the end, I think we tend to always, um, I don't know if this is classical, I think it just has to do with the fact of what can we perceive directly through our senses, you know? And of course, this is much related to, to the range, to the ranges where, where uh, Newtonian mechanics uh, uh, applies very accurately. So, on, but on the other hand, the concepts of of of, uh, of relativity and of general relativity are not problematic in 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 this sense. I think what this attacks a little bit is some uh, at least some. Uh, uh, I think what this argument says is that you really whatever you call empirical evidence. Uh, about whatever uh, uh, that is in which you are justifying your theory on the same on the first place, you really need to take it very seriously, and you cannot then suddenly pretend. If you think of it, the hierarchy of evidences we have for for quantum mechanics is first. I mean, talking experimental evidence, regardless of the interpretation. First, any time we run the experiment, we get one unique outcome. This is what we see. Second. These outcomes are not always the same and they run some probabilities. This is the second. And third, these probabilities for quantum isolated systems can be related one another through unitary transformations and so on. But, but you needed to admit as an empirical evidence that, that, that you got unique outcomes because this is, the, this is the data you're using to justify your theory in the, in the first place. If now you make this, um, this data uh, so subjective that the only way you have to access to it is through is is by admitting by, by using the theory itself because this is a problem. Uh, quantum uh, many worlds interpretation by assuming that the only way you can see the things and see the reality around you is by getting entangled with it, it completely forbids 
any other thing that is not quantum from from accessing the reality that we don't know how 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 any quantum, non quantum thing would access the reality uh, so this is a problem uh, so whatever you call empirical evidence you cannot then put it so subjective so that suddenly you need to depend on the theory to 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 bring it back again and to depend on the theory being universal to to bring it to to recover it so going back to your question i don't know if uh, if, if if i managed to to say at least something related to your question it's not about classical or non classical concept it's about giving giving the deserved trust to the empirical evidence you were using in the first place and this empirical evidence of course have to has to do with clicks of detectors with the spots on the screens with with things that look somehow classical yes i would say this is my answer i just wanted to add one more uh, point to that uh, uh, and i have come across two different uh, understanding of both classical concepts one is typically uh, seeing, seeing classical concepts as referring to classical physics and the other uh, is to understand the word classical concepts as referring to Boolean logic and uh, oh, okay. that refers to the fact that uh, if we create a, a, a set of statements referring to experimental propositions, uh, by that I mean statements describing what was observed and those statements abide by the laws of Boolean logic. So that's that's also another understanding, I believe, of Bohr's uh, emphasis on classical concepts. So in that sense, it refers to classical logic, not to classical okay. physics. So, yeah. Okay, I understand. Um, I wouldn't know exactly what to answer to. I mean, mm. Yeah. yeah, again, it, it for me, it, it has to do, I mean, if whatever empirical evidence, uh, uh, you can handle it because of you, you're, you're, you can possibly handle it with bull and logic, which it seems that empirical evidence having to do with, with our sensual perceptions, I would say that in principle, you should be able to handle it with with uh, th those sort of statements you should be capable of handling it with classical logics with classical logic maybe with with all logic also then in this sense yes but uh but i'm not sure if if um if if this is uh that that much important in the in the in the if you collect some empirical evidence and and this is what you call your empirical evidence and you eventually you may need in order to make sense of this empirical evidence some some logic okay use whatever logic if you wish but again if this is the basis of what, where you're building then you cannot pretend that this very same basis is dependent on your theory holding this is i don't I wouldn't say that in this sense, what logic you are using to express these statements on empirical evidence is, is that relevant, but I'm, I'm not sure. Thank you. So I have a quick question, um, if I okay. may. So yes, first sure. of all, what about interpretations where, I mean, there are interpretations where the unitarity is claimed to apply, for example, to the screen, but mm -hmm. not to the observer or the agent right so mm -hmm. there's some sort of boundary that's placed there mm -hmm. so that i'd be curious to know whether that would affect your argument how would you view such interpretations so and you then, mean yeah so, oh, sorry 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 no, I please, didn't want to please go on yeah. okay so you mean interpretations that are uh, are uh, equipped with some sort of heisenberg cut Let's say, yes, there's a, it's a cut, but for example, the London Bauer interpretation would say the cut is made at the level of a conscious reflection, right? So it's at that point where okay. something happens. There's another interpretation, uh, Richard Healy. In fact, I just spoke with him the other day. He, he was talking about the, the cut being made at the level of the agent. So we're not necessarily talking about consciousness now, but somehow there's an abstract notion of an agent and the agent or the user of the theory is not described uh, unitarily, yeah. but everything else is. Yeah, 
I think I think these uh, these uh, interpretations would not. I mean, they are kind of arguments we do here would would not apply. Actually, in the article we say it explicitly. Here we I didn't want to go through, um, uh, but these these kind of arguments wouldn't wouldn't affect them. There would be, or maybe other problems, but but not. I wouldn't say that they were would be affected. And actually, let me even extend this a little bit. The fact that you consider, for example, in relational interpretations, uh, you consider that the measurement occurs as for the agent, but at the same time as for other agents, uh, the evolution that, like typically in Wigner friends uh, scenarios, no, where you consider that as for the, um, so you have some, um, I, because I, I'm not sure if if, if everybody is aware of Wigner friends scenarios, you may. Uh, have uh, some some person making a quantum measurement on a on a on a system, and as for this person, typically Wigner's friend, uh, is uh, he is called. As for uh, this person, there is a unique outcome coming out, and he has performed an, a measurement in the in the sense um, in the standard sense of of quantum mechanics. But it could be the case that at the same time. There is another observer which is not only observing the experiment that big that the friend does, but actually the friend himself. So he's uh, operating on the on the whole system of the quantum system and the friend measuring the quantum system, and this super observer is describing everything as unitary. And there are approaches like those that, for example, relational quantum mechanics that try to argue that these two situations could be compatible with one another. I don't think that these arguments that we are putting here uh, would apply to those either, because we are not having problems with, with the observer being treated quantum mechanically or unitarily. We are having problem if this treatment of, this unitary treatment of the observer becomes a, depend, a, a necessary ingredient in understanding why the observer gets a unique outcome. If you make this unitarity unnecessary, as in many worlds, this fact that you entangle and you own, this becomes your explanation of the unique outcome you get, then there is when the loop starts. That's what I would say. If you have the microphone closed. Okay, hey, thank you. So I think we're at 4.15 now, so I think we have to uh, wind it up. But thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, yeah, thank you, all the audience, for, for attending. <laughs>